Uh, Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 20. Okay, over your Bibles to Luke chapter 20. We are in this series that we are calling the last part of the gospel, Luke, that we are calling Hope Rising in Them. You know, again, like I said, this is the last week of Jesus' life. This is a, you know, we always like to get to the resurrection. We like to get to the, the point where Christ dies and, and then comes out of the grave because that's, that's one of the highest points of all Christendom. But before we get there, we do go through this last week of Jesus' life. And this last week, now we're going to do it in like a month and a half. So if you're like, Jesse, this week is really long. It is, I apologize. But we're going to do it over the next month and a half or so. And, and as we look through this last week, we see that Jesus hits a lot of moments that are really difficult. And it's important for us to see this because it's important for us to realize that Jesus really does meet us in our darkest times. Hope is really coming, but it's coming in our darkest moments and that Jesus went there far before us. You know, I've been in ministry for quite a while. So probably 15, 20 years I've been on staff or working at a church and been in ministry. And, you know, I got into ministry at a pretty young age. I was in my early 20s, like 21, 22. I had a job at a church. And uh, I was really grateful for that because I got to see a lot of people's lives. Okay, I got to see, a, you know, as a, you know, in my formative years, even before Ashley and I met, you know, and before I started having kids, I got to see people parent. I got to see, you know, people get married and, and, and do their marriage thing. I got to good examples. I got some bad examples. And I've, I got to see a lot and learn a lot from that at a young age. But one thing that I saw all the time is uh, I saw a lot of people after a time of walking with the Lord, turn away from the Lord. Walk away from the Lord. And most of the time, it was because of hardship. It was because of difficulty. And they were left wondering if this is really worth it. And the New Testament talks about this often. Write down this passage and look it up later. James 1, 2 and 4, or 2 through 4, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let, the, and let the steadfastness have its full effect that you may be complete, lacking nothing. And as James reminds us in that passage, that we are going to face trials of various kinds, of many kinds, but those trials produce a steadfastness, a faithfulness. Those trials produce something in us that allows our faith to go deeper. And 1 Peter, another passage you should write down and go back and look up. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9 says this. In this you rejoice, though for now a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it attested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and be filled with the glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And again, Peter follows up what James was just talking about. Trials are coming. Hardships are coming, but we are called to rejoice in them because it produces a steadfastness. It shows a faithfulness. It tests our faith. And when we hit hardships, it does one of two things. It either calls us to run closer and deeper to Jesus or it pushes us away from Jesus. It causes us to turn away from the work and person of Jesus Christ or cause us to drill down deeper and test our faith and see that it is good. Hardship's meant to do that. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you are going to face moments of those. But it's what we do with that that creates steadfastness. And here in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 20, we understand and we start to see something that we don't just go through this hardship and learn steadfastness on our own, but we see that Jesus goes through it before we ever get there. Jesus puts a faithfulness on display so that when you and I hit those moments of hardship, we can trust Jesus. And that's the big idea this morning that in times of hardship, we remain steadfast by trusting Jesus. We remain steadfast by trusting Jesus. In this chapter, 
We're going to get the whole chapter, so we're going to be here a while. So hopefully you guys order Jimmy John's and uh, maybe get a little bit of coffee at about 11.30 because we got a lot to cover. Uh, but in this whole chapter, what we see is we see the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders continually pursue and antagonize Jesus. And at any moment, Jesus could have said, I'm done with this. I don't deserve this. But instead, he remained faithful and steadfast. And even as he does, he teaches us things that we can learn about to teach us to be faithful and steadfast. And so this morning, one of the first truths that we learned, so what, what Jesus does here, we got a, we got a, a section, the, the chapter 20 goes through 1 through 26, where Jesus is engaging with the Sanhedrin, okay, this whole group of Pharisees and religious leaders. That's going to be the longest section. My first point is going to be about 45 minutes. My second point is going to be about 10, and my third point about 5 so just, just be ready. But it is going to be, the first section is going to be a little bit longer because Jesus has this long interaction. But in this interaction, he teaches us to trust Jesus' authority. That's the first point this morning, that we need to trust Jesus' authority. And this is picking up right after last week's message. Last week, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and then he's weeping over Jerusalem and then he goes in and he turns over the tables and the, uh, you know, kicks the people out of the temple because they're turning the temple into a house or a den of thieves or they're making a buck off the law of God. And, and, and then after that, Jesus goes right back into teaching in the temple and that's what we pick up in Luke chapter 20 of verse 1. It says this, starting in verse one. Ah, uh, one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and scribes and elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority do you do these things? Or who is it that gave you this authority? And he answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or of man or from man? They discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority do I do these things? So this is a, Jesus' first interaction with this group of religious leaders. Now, it says that it's the... Um, uh, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, basically they're, they're describing this group of people called the Sanhedrin, okay? And the Sanhedrin was the ruling party of that time in the Jewish nation. This was the head honchos of the head honchos. Uh, Jesus had engaged with different Pharisees and scribes and religious leaders kind of throughout the whole gospel of Luke. But right here, this is the guys, okay? And, you know, again, what happened is Jesus is, preaching and teaching. He's throwing people out of the temple and all of these guys. Like, how, how is he doing this? Why is he doing this? And so they come to Jesus to question him. Look what they say. They say, tell us by what authority, because the first authority that he's refer they're referring to is, what authority do you do this by? How do you know these things? How do you have these things? But then also, who is it that gave you this authority? And what group of people or what person do you claim that authority came from? Where is your authority and where did it come from? And Jesus knew what they were trying to do. They were trying to trick him into giving answers so they could use against him. Instead of answering their question, he goes and he asks a question of his own. Well, before, the, uh, you, before I answer you, answer me this. Was John's baptism, talking about the John the Baptist, we I preached on him you know, early last year uh, in the early parts of Luke, and he's in the other Gospels, and John the Baptist was a prophet sent from God. Uh, he was making the pathway for Jesus. You know, we know that John would, you know, preach and call people to repentance, and then he would baptize them in, uh, you know, in their faith. He was kind of the first time we really started to see baptism happening was through John. And they called John a prophet. They understood that John was from God. And at one moment, uh, when Jesus came upon John the Baptist, John declares Jesus the Messiah. This is the one that's from God. He is the one that God sent. John, and everybody knew it, declared Jesus to be the Messiah. And so what Jesus was asking, listen, who, whose authority or was John's baptism from heaven or from man, they had a conundrum to deal with. Well, if we say it's 
if we say it's from heaven, well, then we're going to declare Jesus really to be from God. And Jesus, you know, throughout all of the gospel, Luke has been, you know, rejecting the, the religious leaders and calling them out. And so if we really say he's from God, we have to acknowledge all of the things that he's been teaching about us. Oh, we can't say that. But if we say he's from man, well, man, everybody believes that he's a prophet. And so they're going to stone us and kill us. We're going to lose our place of prestige. The people that respect us will no longer respect us. So they did what any good politicians do. They said nothing. He said nothing. You see, what this tells us, and Jesus then goes back and says, listen, I'm not going to answer you if you're not going to answer me. But what it shows right away from the very get-go is that the uh, these Sanhedrin, these, these guys from uh, the religious leaders, they didn't really want to know the truth. They just wanted a certain outcome. They weren't coming to Jesus to trust Jesus. They just wanted their own thing to happen. They weren't coming to know Jesus They were coming to reject and fight against Jesus. And we can't go to Jesus that way. That is not trusting Jesus. That is, you know, a lot of times we'll do the exact same thing as the Pharisees, is we will try to make our own Jesus. We're not worried about the truth. We just want what we want. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus goes in and he uses this moment, continues to build on this point that we need to trust Jesus' authority. Looking for Look at verse 9. It says, And he began to tell the people a parable. A man planted a vineyard and let out and let it out to his tenants and went into another country for a long while. And when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat him and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent a, yet a third, and this one they also wounded and cast it out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him. So the inheritance, or so the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? So... You know, they're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to get him into kind of this, uh, you know, stating things that they can use against him. And then Jesus kind of flips it on his head and says a parable. And in this parable, what, he, what he's talking about is that this, this guy who um, buys this land and creates a vineyard. And instead of growing it for himself, he leases it out or he sells it out to some farmers. And they get in, they have several years where they grow uh, this vineyard. And then out of the vineyard, um, they will pay the owner, whether it's the sum of money or whether he gets part of the crop or whatever the case is. And so after a few years, he sends a servant back to get what is owed to him. And instead of giving it to him, uh, the, the farmers beat the slave. They beat the servant. And so he sends another one. They beat him and shamefully treat him. And they beat the next one and, he tra- and they shamefully treat him. And you know, it gets progressively worse with each one. And finally, when all, you know, whether it was every year for three years, whether it was all in one season, we don't really know. But after he sent three people, it's finally like, all right, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send my son. They're going to treat my son respectfully. But in, instead, they kill him. Well, this is the inheritance. This is the guy who's going to get this field. If we kill him off and then the father dies, we get this to ourselves. And so they, they kill him off. They murder the son. And then Jesus asked the question, what then will the owner of the vineyard do? That's the whole point of the parable, getting to this place. How is the father going to respond? Verse 16, he will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this talk about the crowds, they said, surely not. Why? Because the crowds were starting to understand what Jesus was saying. They were understanding that Jesus was starting to, that he he was now uh, out loud claiming to be the Messiah. He was claiming that the religious leaders were no longer doing what they were called to do, but not only that they were no longer called to do what they were, or not only do what they were called to do, but that they were going to be rejected and destroyed. No, surely not, Jesus. That's not what's going to happen. Look at verse 17. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? That the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
that everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus didn't mince words. Jesus is trying to point out that the very thing that God was going to use to build his whole kingdom on, the the cornerstone of Jesus was being rejected by these guys. Now, having a a cornerstone uh, was... Uh, really, like having a really good cornerstone was really important. Okay, that's what you built everything off of. It's kind of like pouring concrete, right, Sal? You know, when you start to pour a basement and you and you set the walls, if if the corners are off a little bit, okay, the whole house is going to be off. So you got to square it off and get it around. You got to shift it this way and shift it that way. So it's the same because if you don't get that first part right, everything else is messed up. The same is true with the cornerstone when they did it. So they had to have this real a stone that a lot of time would be rejected because it wasn't perfect. And, And Jesus is saying that a lot of people rejected him, but God made him the cornerstone because he was the right one. But not only that, but this is verse 18, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. So he switches the analogy a little bit. That the stone, now those who are stumbling over it or who are no longer accepting it, they're going to be destroyed by this. Why? Because they're rejecting the authority of God. They're rejecting the gift that God had sent. It's kind of like um, um, my two-year-old, okay? My two-year-old is uh, Judah. You guys know Judah. He runs around here quite a bit. I haven't seen him today. Was, did he come today? Oh, yeah, I did see him. He ran in the bathroom after me. Okay, so Judah, he's, he's two. And, um, uh, you know, he's, he's hitting that two stage finally. You know, he's starting to become a kid. He's uh, starting to test his boundaries, to say the least. And, you know, those of us who have kids, like, we've been through that. They hit that two-year-old stage, and there are some days that are really good, and there are some days that are really hard. And the days that Judah trusts my authority, he does a lot better. Why? Because I'm his dad. But the days that he doesn't trust my authority, man, those days go bad for him. Why? Well, one, uh, you know, my authority over Judah is meant to help protect him, to guide him, to keep him from destroying himself on the things that he would destroy himself on. You know, this kid like, you know, runs a thousand miles an hour at everything. That's why he literally bleeds all the time. And so I got to guide him. And, you know, Judah, don't run down the stairs that way. Don't run around this corner that way. You got to be careful over here. This is a good place to run and wrestle your brothers. This is not a good, you know, when you're on the third bunk, don't wrestle Micah. That's going to hurt when you fall. Okay. What? That's, I don't really have a third bunk yet, but I'm just waiting for the day. Uh, but that's at the authority. God's giving the authority over Judah to protect him, to teach him, to respond to that, to, to keep him from getting hurt. Also, when he fights against my authority, he gets consequences. You know, that's a hard day for Judah when he gets consequences. Why? Because he's not listening. He's got to learn to respect and honor dad. And the authority of a parent is a good thing to help a child flourish. The authority of God, the authority of Jesus is meant to help us flourish. And if we don't, destruction is coming both in this life and the next life coming under the authority of Jesus is good. And still, again, we see the Pharisees just don't get it. One more interaction with them in this section. Look at verse 19. It says, The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him that, or at, that, at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. But they feared, that the, or, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something that he said, so as to deliver him up from the authority of jur- uh, jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly, and you show no partiality, but the truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived the craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, They render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answers, they became silent. And so, you know, again here, uh, they don't learn their lesson. They come after Jesus one more time, challenging his authority, testing his authority. And they send spies in there to, to look and see or try to test Jesus one last time. And so they, they use uh, their, one of their favorite crutches, 
The Roman authorities. Now, the Roman authorities were over the Jewish people at the time. We've talked about this a bunch of times. And the Jewish people were under them, and they didn't really like it for the most part because they couldn't do their own thing. And part of that was having to pay taxes to Caesar. Now, the Romans didn't like paying taxes to Caesar because Caesar wasn't their god. Caesar wasn't their king, but they still lived in the Roman Empire. But a lot of Jewish people fought against that. On the other hand, if you know Jesus told them, well, you know, you don't need to pay taxes. That's fine. You're right. Then the people would celebrate, but the Roman Empire wouldn't like that so much. They would throw him over. But if Jesus said, well, you really should pay taxes, you know, he's your emperor and you deserve, they deserve all of this, then the Jewish people would be all upset. And so again, they're trying to catch Jesus in between this and try to get him to, you know, to, to people to reject Jesus' authority, to reject Jesus as God, to reject Jesus as Messiah. But again, Jesus just handles it perfectly. <laughs> Show me some money. Let's look at that money. Whose inscriptions on that money? Whose inscriptions on that denarii? Oh, it's Caesar's. I'll tell you what, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but uh, give to God what is God's. You see, what Jesus does in that, just that very statement, he says, listen, yes, we do have to pay to those who deserve, those who God has set as our governing authority at that time. You know, we do have to pay respect. We do have to pay honor to some extent, but that doesn't trump your authority to God. God is our highest authority at all times. And what Jesus is doing, even in this teaching, is going back and saying, yeah, we do do this, but ultimately it's to God. And Jesus is showing off and displaying the authority that God holds over even Caesar. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. And again, this whole first section, we see the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin continually pursuing Jesus and coming after Jesus and trying to take, you know, dismount Jesus and show Jesus why we shouldn't trust him with uh, his authority, trust his authority. But time and time again, Jesus shows, no, my authority is good. Listen, I came here to die and save you from your sins. If you don't trust me, destruction is coming. And that destruction's coming because you have chosen to sin against me. But I didn't just leave you there. I came out of heaven to take your place to pay for your sins so that you can trust me as your savior. But that means trusting in Jesus' authority. That means on a daily basis, you know, in, the, in our hardest of moments, in those the, the, the days, the weeks, uh, when we hit our anxiety, when we hit our, our moments where uh, we just don't understand how we're going to get through this month, when it's been a year or two years of dealing with the same thing, it's like, God, are you really there? Can I really trust you over this? And it's in those moments that we have to be reminded that we really can trust Jesus' authority. We cannot make a God of our own choosing. That's what the, Israel, or that's what the Jewish people were trying to do. We can't make a God of our own choosing. At the end of that is destruction. But Jesus really is God over all things. And we have to give to God where is God. And if we're going to get through hard moments in our life, it's going to be because we trust the authority of Jesus over those moments. It means that we trust Jesus to get us those moments where we obey in those moments. Or it's not just believing that God is good, but it's believing that God is right. And I'm going to come under, and I'm going to listen. And just like Judah is called to listen to Dad, I'm called to listen to God. So knowing God's word, trusting God's word, trusting that he's the perfect ruler. Most of our uh, difficulty in this life or when it comes to you know, trusting authority comes from uh, a bad authority over us. You know, it's hard to trust because they failed us and they failed us. My boss or our president or this person or that person and broken pastors have failed you many of times. I'm one of them. But Jesus isn't. He's the perfect authority. He will never let us down. Be reminded that heaven is coming, where we will live in a perfect kingdom where nothing broken will be left unfixed. Reminded to trust Jesus' authority. Then two, we got two more points. These two are a little bit shorter. We got to that first one. The second thing is that we need to trust that Jesus brings life. 
Trust that Jesus brings life. We need to trust in Jesus' authority in hard times. In hard times, we need to trust that Jesus brings life. Now we run into these next people. Look at verse 27. Now we move on to this, the Sadducees. They're really sad, you see. Why? Well, there came to him some Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection. So this was a, another sect of the religious leaders, and they didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe that there was something after this. In fact, they believed a lot of what this world and our culture believes today, that this is the only life you're ever going to have. So you better make it worth your while. But they didn't believe in the resurrection. Verse 28, and they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses, those who we base everything on, Moses, that guy, wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children, that man must take a widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will this will the woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. Okay, we gotta do a little bit of digging here. This one takes a little bit of work. But um, what is happening here is these guys, they don't believe in the coming resurrection. They don't believe that there's gonna be an afterlife. And so they are trying to disprove uh, and show how foolish it really is to believe in the resurrection. And so what they do is they go back and say, well, Jesus, there's this Old Testament law all the way back in the Old Testament. And this law really is there. It was a, a law from Moses. And this law was a, a law that was meant to protect the lineage of God's people. It was a law that was meant to protect the welfare of a woman because uh, in Old Testament biblical times, a, a woman... Uh, had very little worth, and all of her worth was bound up in her uh, husband, in her family, in their children. And so if a woman was married and her husband died, she had a very hard life after her. And so this was one of the times when, you know, this law is no longer in effect, but this was a law that God allowed to protect women. And, and so she would marry the brother of her spouse. And that first child that she would have would then be a child of her former husband protecting that line. A lot We don't do this today. Uh, this is no longer in effect, but it was a law that God allowed to protect the lineage and the welfare of women. But this is no longer practiced in this section or in, where we are in, in Luke as well. And so it's a purely academic question. Well, Jesus, there was this law back then. How do we handle this law? And if we follow through in this law and she goes through and has this husband and this husband and this husband and this husband, when you get to heaven, who's she going to be really married to? We got you, Jesus. See, this is how I see this law. It doesn't, it doesn't align with the resurrection. The resurrection makes no sense. This is just stupid. This law only makes sense in this life now. And by Jesus' grace, he carefully goes back through and he answers them. And look at verse 34. It says, And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to obtain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because uh, they are equal to angels and are the sons of God, being the sons of the resurrection. So Jesus immediately goes in and says, Let's, let's talk about marriage. Okay, marriage is a thing in a relationship of this age. And marriage is a very good thing. Okay, you look at what the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage is sanctification. <laughs> Us growing into Christ likeness. You want to go into Christ likeness? Get married. And, but it's, it's, you know, my greatest sins. You know who shows them to me? My wife does. She shows me. She makes me more and more like Christ. Living together is hard, and that's good. Okay, you know, marriage is meant to grow us into a Christ likeness. Marriage is meant to give us a picture of Jesus' relationship to the church, Ephesians 5. It's, it's meant to, to, for us to display, you know, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave himself up for her. He died. Husbands, love your wives like, like the church loves Christ. Why? Because Christ died for it. It's, it's a picture of the church. Not only that, but marriage is a, a picture of God. It gives us some understanding of what the relationship in heaven is going to be like. It's all of these things that are meant to lead us to understand God in a better way. And it's also meant to be fruitful and multiply. That's part of marriage throughout the Bible, bearing children and, and continuing on. But again, all of these things end in heaven. Okay, we're not going to die. 
We're going to be like angels. Okay, we're not going to have to understand God because God is going to be right there. We don't need pictures of God because God's going to be there. Marriage isn't needed to display God like it is anymore. So Jesus is going through all of these things and showing, listen, marriage was something for something of this age, but when you get to heaven, it's not going to be needed anymore. But while we're here, let's stay at this, let's stay at this topic of life. Let's stay at this topic of the resurrection. Let me keep going. Jesus doesn't waste this moment. He then goes into verse 37. He says, but that the dead are raised, even Moses. Talk about Moses. Can you talk about this Mosaic law? Let's talk about Moses over here. Let's talk about Moses over here. Moses showed in the passage about the bush, talk about the burning bush, where he calls the Lord God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What he was referring to there is when Moses goes into, uh, or goes up to the burning bush in Exodus, and he, he sees it, and he refers to the bush, knowing that he's talking to God, and he refers to God in the bush, who really is God, as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Not the God who was the God of them, because Abraham was dead, right? And Jacob was dead, right? And Isaac was dead long before Moses was ever alive. But in Moses' very statement, he was saying, no, this is the God of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham wasn't dead. Abraham and Moses believed in the afterlife. They understood that the fulfillment of God's promise was in heaven. And when, when Moses referred to the God, he referred to the God of the living. Verse 38. Now, he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. For all live to him. God is a God of life. God is a God that brings life. This life, we currently live because of our sin, because God created us and made us in his image to reflect him, to live like him, to know him deeply. But because of our sin, we have rejected God and this, and, and this life is broken. And you know what we try to do? We try to take the place that God was meant to fill in our soul and we fill it with so many other things because we want the life. But that life doesn't fill us. And in fact, every time we go after this and this and this and this and this thing and that thing, we want that kind of relationship. We want this lifestyle. We want to get this job. We want to get this college degree. We want to have that. We want to get here. We want to get to that. And every time we get to one of those things, it's not enough. Why? Because that doesn't bring life. But God is the God of life. Jesus came to bring life. Jesus came to die on the cross to pay for our sins, to pay the consequence of our sin, which is death, so that we can have a resurrection to life. Our hope in this life is the life that Jesus brings. But along with that, we find life here and now through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Anytime we go to something else other than Jesus to find that life, it's going to leave us empty. But when we turn to Jesus, he brings that life we so greatly desire. Do you just watch Pawn Stars? Do you remember? The, you like Pawn Stars, right, Bryce? Like, I like Pawn, Pawn Stars, American Pickers. What's the other one? Oh, um, uh, Antique Roadshow. You guys watch the Antique Roadshow? I love those shows. I used to watch them all the time. And my favorites, I know this is really kind of like terrible and somewhat sadistic, but I would love it when people would come in, they would be all excited about what they were bringing in. Like, I'm going to add this to my collection or this has to be worth this much money or I've been searching all over for this piece to finish off this. And they get all really excited and they come in and they want to, you know, show off their findings or how much it's worth or how it's going to really be the thing that they really want it to be. The, the thousand dollar bill that was from like the 18, 1977, I don't know, whatever. But they bring it in, okay? And if you've watched these shows, you've seen many of these. These are my favorite. They would be all excited. And they would show it to the people, whether it be, what's the Pawn Stars guy's name? What's the first? The, the, Rick. Yeah, bring it in to Rick. Or, uh, what's the tall, skinny guy on, chair, uh, on um, American Pickers? What's the tall, skinny guy? Uh, what's his name? I should remember. I should have looked these things up. But, you know, they go to him or what, what's his name? Yeah, Mike Wolf. I liked him. He's a good guy, too. I loved their van, by the way, too. But, you know, they, they bring these things in, and um, they're all excited. And so then they bring in, you know, people to critique these things. Oh, let's see if this is real, or let's bring in an authority on the subject. Let's see how much it's really worth. And they bring in somebody, and there's that moment where, like, oh, oh, yeah, that's not really what you thought it was. 
<laughs> oh yeah, that's that. You paid how much for that? <laughs> you know, is that like I know, like some people like the celebration when they make a lot of. I liked it a lot worse. I don't. Is that really bad? Maybe. But, you know, there's that moment where all of a sudden everything they thought to be true just falls apart because they had so much hope that this piece was the final part of their collection. They had so much hope because this was going to be sold. I'm going to make bank. They thought that this was going to be the thing that they were looking forward to. And they just walk out completely dejected. And they always you know it's the best part is when they get on and they start filming him on TV. Oh, it's not okay. It's not a big deal. I, this is really going to be what I really wanted it to be. Oh, no, they're wrong. I'm going to really sell it. No, you're, you're lying. You're just trying to make yourself feel better. Anytime we try to fill our life and find life with the things of this world, that's what ends up in our soul. Because it won't fill the life that Jesus brings. God is the God of life, not the God of death. We are waiting for the resurrection. We are waiting for the moment when Christ comes back and and brings us to heaven, to his kingdom. That is where the fulfillment of this takes place. But even here and now, if you and I are going to live in a way that displays the life of Jesus, it's because we trust Jesus to bring us that life. We understand that God is a God of the living, not the God of the dead. And in the moments of hardship and difficulty, in the middle of your darkest moments, what you turn to to find life will define your life. And if we're going to see a hope rising in the darkest times, it's going to rise because we turn to Jesus time and time again for life. Turning to his word, turning to seasons of prayer, turning to God's people, not turning to the things that I would normally turn to, the things that I think make my life valuable or make my life better by turning to Jesus time and time again. Trusting Jesus' authority, trusting that Jesus brings life, and then lastly, trusting that Jesus really is God. Trusting that Jesus really is God. This is the last truth. And finally, Jesus has been dealing with the Sanhedrin, and then he's dealing with the Sadducees, and finally, Jesus kind of goes on the offensive a little bit. He kind of goes on the offensive a little bit, and he makes an argument. This is an argument that takes a little bit of work to get through, but we'll do it, and I think it's an argument that's of value. Verse 41, he says, but he said to them, now he's, after they've no longer dared to ask him questions, he comes out and he says to them, how can they say that Christ, the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, quoting Psalms 110 here, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is it that he is David's son? So Jesus then goes after. So he gets done answering questions and coming back up to this. And finally he comes to, let me ask you a question of my own. Let me ask you a question of my own. Well, how is it that uh, David calls the Messiah his Lord? And what he's referring to here is um, in in their culture and time, okay, where where they were at, uh, somebody with a grandfather or somebody like King David, somebody who came long before, uh, was seen to be of more value, more authority than those coming after. So the father was always greater than the son. The grandfather was always greater than the grandson. And the farther you got from, uh, whether a uh, you know, family head or whatever, um, the less you were compared to that. And so, you know, the Messiah, which is prophesied throughout the Old Testament, which is talked about throughout the New Testament, Messiah, the, the coming Savior, uh, was understood to be David's son. Okay, we looked at that back in Luke chapter 16, where, or 18, where um, you know, the blind beggar refers to Jesus as the son of David, which was a, a messianic term, a term for the Messiah. But they understood the Messiah not to be God because they was in the line of David and from David, they thought the Messiah was just going to be like David. So he was going to be a king. He was going to wipe out the Roman Empire and set up shop in his own kingdom right over uh, where the old kingdom was. And they were going to take care of, and the Jesus or the the Messiah, the one who was to come, was just going to be like David. They didn't think that he was actually God. They just thought he was sent from God. But Jesus is like, hang on, time out. Let's look at some Old Testament. Let's look at Psalms 110. See where David says, the Lord, 
The Lord said to my Lord, he's referring to a time when he's talking to God about the Messiah and he talks to God about the Messiah using the same term, Lord to my Lord. David himself refers to the Messiah as God. What Jesus is saying is, listen, David, the very one that you build this argument knew, knew, am I good? Am I good, John? Give John, John does a lot of work. Give John a round of applause. He keeps us, if it wasn't for John, every Sunday that John's not here, something goes wrong. And I literally have to FaceTime John. John, I desperately need you to help with this. I'm glad that John is here. He can work these kinks out because we would be in trouble if it wasn't for him. But, um, you know, Jesus here is saying, listen, you think that the Messiah is not God, but even David, King David, who you say that the Messiah is going to come from, knew that the Messiah was his God. Jesus is reminding uh, these leaders and these followers that the Messiah himself is really God. And you know what? That's important for us to remember today too. Jesus is not just some prophet, some good guy. Jesus himself is God. And so often I you know, declare, hey, I believe that Jesus is God, but how often do my actions really not show that I believe that Jesus is God? Jesus is God, but is he really God of my soul all the time? Is he really God of my life? And if you and I are going to get through the hardest moments in our life, we have to believe that Jesus is God. Why? Because those are hard moments. Even in this last year, there have been so many times when, you know, I've been sitting and praying and just thinking about this last year and just, you know, whether it was, I mean, do you guys even remember like, with, like that shooting that happened at Miller Coors like almost a year ago? Like I almost forgot about that because of all the other things that have happened since then. And I just remember sitting even at, you know, at the beginning of last year, you know, just remembering how the Milwaukee community was shocked. And even this, and there's been so many things that have happened since then. You know, it's like, man, how do we deal with all this? And there's just so many times where I felt so inadequate. Like what do I have to offer anyone? You know, how can we help anyone through these situations? How can I get myself through situations, let alone my family and those that we serve? And in that moment, Jesus is no longer God. I've made myself God. I'm thinking about what I'm trying to do and what I have to do and with this and this and this. Now we gotta remember that Jesus is God because God has the power and authority to get us through the hardest moments. Even when we feel like our country is falling apart or those around us, our family is breaking or or our community or this or that. It's like, Lord, I can't do anything. You're right, but I still have power over that. I am God over that situation. I have control over that and I can get you through it. I can give you what you need. And see, in those hardest moments of our life, we don't just need a good person. We need God. And we need to be reminded that Jesus himself is God. God himself that came to die in our place. He didn't, Jesus or God didn't just send a representative. He sent himself to take our place on the cross so that we can have a relationship with God and so that we can rely on God. But we have to continually remember that Jesus is more than just a lucky rabbit's foot. Jesus is more than just a simple prophet. Jesus is God in whatever situation you and I go through. He has the power to get us through it, to give us what we need to work in it. But we have to trust Jesus as God. You see what happens at the very end of this passage. Let's look at how Jesus ends this. And he says, uh, starting in verse 28, it says, when he said these things, or not that passage, I'm, in verse 45, and he hearing all of these, the, all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes, who like to walk around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, and the best seats in the synagogue, and the places of honor at feasts, and who devour the widows and houses, or devour widows' houses, if a pretense make long prayers, that they will receive the greater, or that they will receive greater condemnation. And Jesus ends this, this section condemning the Pharisees and the religious leaders. Why? Because they walked away from Jesus. They walked away from God. They weren't steadfast. When they hit trials, instead of trusting God, they made their own God. Instead of going to God for life, they built their own life. Instead of worshiping God as God, they did their own thing. And in turn, their whole ministry was worth nothing. 
And if you and I aren't going to end up in that place, it's going to be because in our hardest moments, we remain steadfast by trusting Jesus. So this week, I want to encourage you. Take some time and say, God, I want to trust you as my authority. I believe that you have put this book over me and I'm going to do my best to learn and obey. I'm going to spend time with you and delight in you. Lord, I believe that you bring life in those moments where I know that I am looking for something more. I need something. I'm not going to turn to my Netflix. I'm not going to turn to my shows. I'm not going to turn to my hobbies, to my food, to this, to that. I'm going to to take some time and I'm going to fall on my knees, Lord. Lord, I'm going to believe that you are my God. And the next time that I'm struggling with anxiety or doubt or depression, instead of turning to that, I'm going to turn to the power that only comes from God that can get myself. And I'll tell you what, I was going to save this. I'm using it now anyways. (laughs) When I'm in that moment where I am uh, viewing all of the doubt in my life and, and putting myself up as God, my prayers are so weak. And it's like, Lord, I don't know how to get through this situation. But when I take time to remember that Jesus is my God and the power that God has, and that God has the power to change the situation, that God has the power over this, that God can bring revival, that God can work in this person and that person. You want to know how much stronger my prayers are? Oh, my prayer life grows. Why? Because I believe that Jesus is God. And that's what we need this season as we go into this Easter time, as we are trying to bring hope to a desperate world. We have to understand that Jesus is God and he is the only thing that can meet people where they're at. We need to trust Jesus in our hardest times. Now, we're going to close. Imagine they're going to listen to our songs. Uh, but we're going to take communion. And again, communion is one of the greatest ways to remind our soul of these things to remind our soul of the work that Jesus did and say, Jesus, I trust you. Because communion is that time where we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus. We remember Christ's body broken for my sin. That, that Christ died on my behalf. He took my sin. He, he took my brokenness and his body was broken on my behalf. And just take a moment to remember. Why do I trust Jesus? Because he gave himself for us. And then we take the, the cup, the blood, and it's to remember that Christ's blood spilled so that we can have grace. So now when God looks at me, he no longer sees the sinfulness of Jesse, but he sees the perfection of Jesus. It's a reminder of, of Christ's work in me. And at Vertical, we, we, uh, we don't do it all at once. We'll do a couple songs. After doing songs, you can go back. And it's for believers. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus, you can go to the back and it's on the table in there and, and grab it in your own time. But I would encourage you... Um, to take that time and just reflect a little bit and remind yourself of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Remind what Jesus went through in our behalf. Why do I trust Jesus in the hardest times? Because he went through the hardest moments to save me from those times. Christ's body was broken on my behalf. Christ's blood was spilled so I can have his grace. God, we come before you this morning. And God, we're again just so grateful um, that we can trust you. And God, even as we're looking at some of the hardest moments of your life, Lord, that we know that we can trust those moments because you have been faithful in them. God, that when you were challenged, God, when people came against you, when death was, when you faced death, you did it all head on because you loved us and cared for us, Lord. And Lord, as we are facing times of trials and tribulations, Lord, I pray that we would turn to you to find our steadfastness, God, that we would trust in your authority, God, that we would trust in the life that you bring, God, that we would trust that you are God. And Lord, that you would be doing a work in our hearts and souls. And Lord, during this time, uh, God, just as people are looking for something more, Lord, that, that just you would be spilling out of us, Lord, that we would see people saved, God, that we would see people come to know you, that we would see people return, that we would see new lives made because you are working in us. And God, as we, God, as we take communion, just remind our hearts and souls of the sacrifice you paid in our behalf. God, remind us of how much you love and care for us, Lord. And let us worship you through all that. In Jesus' name.